goodness. Uh, it should be up, but let me know if it's not. I think, I, ah, I get it right. So I had the opportunity to give a sponsor slot, but because we wanted to make more time available, I said, no, I'm not gonna do the sponsor slot, so my sponsor slot is these 10 seconds. We make websites, web apps, we help you with your team, yada, yada, titan.com, say hi at the booth. Cool, great. Um, okay, <laughs> thanks. You know who we are, if you don't, come say hi. So my talk actually is the business case for Livewire. And I am one of the business guys, Ian Landsman is the business guy, but I'm sort of like associate business guy in the Laravel world because I'm a CEO and I talk about business and Laravel and Livewire and that kind of stuff. And I end up having to make the business case for our technologies often because a lot of people say, oh, PHP, that thing I wrote 30 years ago when I was first learning how to code, right? And that's still the idea they have of our world. It's I learned how to code and I wrote really terrible procedural PHP and then I grew up and I started writing Ruby and then I moved to Elixir and Erlang and stuff, stuff. and so they'd see it as the past and so we have to make the, the case for the present. But the case for Livewire is a little bit different because once you're asking the question about Livewire, you've probably already had the case for Laravel made to you and so now it's Laravel plus what? What comes after that? My friend, whom I love and adore, Brannick, recently had a tweet that he put out and he said, spent the last few weeks screening and interviewing Laravel devs. I was surprised by how many position themselves specifically as tall stack or live wire developers. This will be controversial, but I think it's an unfortunate direction for both the developers and the Laravel community. Oof. I kind of like went like, you know, like wildfire the community and we're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? You know, he's very successful. He's had a successful exit. Uh, this is not a great moment for us. And I caveat his second and third tweet had way more context. He and I talked privately. I brought him the podcast. We talked publicly. But there's kind of a message that we get there. And it's a message from his tweet. It's a message from a lot of the rest of the community. And that message is React 1. Sorry, Livewire. Sorry, Alpine. Sorry, Vue, definitely sorry, Angular. Uh, React won. But I'm gonna say the truth is React sort of won. And it kind of depends on what metrics you're looking at for what won actually means. And so I wanna ask the question of what are those metrics that leads us to believe that React won, or some of us to think that way. Most jobs, sure. Most developers writing it, definitely. But those are not necessarily the only metrics for us to think about. React won, to me, in the same way that full stack JavaScript won. And if you've ever written full stack JavaScript, you understand that this is a burn, not a good thing. And I love React, right? React is great. Uh, I don't love full stack JavaScript. But we all know that just because a lot of people use something or like it doesn't actually mean it's necessarily good or better in any particular way. So then we ask the question of, well, if those are not the metrics to look at, numbers are not the right metrics, what should our metrics be? And well, since my talk is the business case for Livewire, then the question is, what does the business case mean? And to me, the business case means what tool set best accomplishes or best allows businesses to accomplish their goals or founders to accomplish their dreams? How can we answer that question and then use that to decide what tech stack we're gonna work with? To me, the goal of any software company is in the end to ship software to users. It's to ship code to production. And we could add lots of modifiers onto that. We can say functional code, secure code, scalable code, reliable, maintainable, beautiful, maybe even profitable code. But in the end, it's shipping software to users, because we're not doing that, what are we actually doing as software developers? So then our question becomes, how do we best enable developers to ship software, and again, with all those caveats, you know, profitable, et cetera, et cetera, to users? To me, that has always been about minimizing the friction between an idea and that idea being deployed as functional software. There's so many things that get in the way of, I have an idea and I want it to work like this, and it's actually usable by users, and when we minimize those friction points, that is what best allows us to actually accomplish those goals. So what usually causes friction? Well, the number one thing is not code related. Okay, this is um, scrums, story points, planning meetings, uh, process theater to satisfied and competent managers, right? Like those things don't get solved based on the tech stack we're using. Good news, I've got a Laracast all about that that's free. Go check it out, it's got at least a couple episodes out, uh, just laracast.com, and this is all about that stuff. But that's not what we're talking about today, we're talking about code. So what coding issues cause friction? Well, we've got duplicated effort in code, where more than one person works on the same thing, or there's more than one chunk of code that's working on the same thing. We've got features split across multiple code bases. If I build a feature, and I have to have three different pull requests, and have to facilitate them all being managed at the same time, but three different sets of tests and all this kind of stuff, that's friction, right? Uh, complicated deploy setups. I should be able to merge the code and it goes live, and the longer the time is, and the more effort there is between I merge that code and it actually goes live, the more friction there is for my idea to deploy. 
and finally, multiple people being required per feature. And I'm not saying there shouldn't be multiple people looking at the feature, but that should be an optional thing we do because of code review processes or pair programming, not because it takes three different people just to get anything changed in this freaking website. Big difference, lots of friction. So if we wanna maximize business's ability to ship software by minimizing friction, Livewire looks real sexy. Livewire allows one person to write one set of code for one feature in one code base with one set of tests and one standardized deploy process. That is a great way to ship software. It's a great way to reduce friction. It makes shipping code easier. And so it makes hiring easier too. You're saying I can, you know, people ask me all the time about building dev teams and I talk about how you can, you know, build a dev team smaller, larger, less friction or whatever. And it always comes down to like, I can hire a single developer and they can take your idea as a business owner, as a founder, and they can build the front end and the back end, and they can write the tests, and they can handle all the deploys, all with one person, versus having to hire three different types of people in three different roles, all to get a single feature launched. Coding is easier. What is the worst thing for a programmer? Usually context switching, right? There's so much less context switching when you're all dealing with a single code base, because it all is a single technology that's handling your front end, your back end, your testing, your deploys, and everything else. Testing is easier. We had an entire talk about this, but you've got one testing framework, asterisk, baked in for you. And it works out of the box with all the niceties like mocking and code coverage, uh, parallel processing, processing, validation testing. It just works and it covers the full stack end to end in a single framework. The amount of work people have wasted trying to get testing set up in their JavaScript front ends and just giving up and only having back end coverage, gone with Livewire. Deploying, easier. If it deploys Laravel, it deploys Livewire. That's about it. You don't have to have separate server requirements, separate server building steps or anything else like that. It's just all in one place. However, it wouldn't be a Matt Stauffer talk if I didn't say it depends with the little trademark after it. Livewire is not perfect for every project. And if you are going to say something is the solution to all these things and you don't ever you know, have any caveats, then you're not really being honest and people can't totally trust you. So I have to give the caveats. There are some places where Livewire is not the right fit, just like there are some places where PHP and Laravel aren't the right fit, and that's completely fine. I will give two examples here, although funny enough, the initial example is less relevant because of the things that Caleb announced this morning uh, with Livewire Forge, I love, and this is great. But the first one to me is, oops, I was supposed to flip to that code, that screen. Um, we had a client come to us and they were building uh, Bible software, and it's this really kind of crazy, like three different versions of the Bible parallel, and if you're highlighting one, then it's highlighting the other one, and then you also have your bookmarks, and your bookmarks show up in each place, and if you type it in one place, it's all this stuff that is not about pages, it's not even necessarily about components, but it's just this crazy amount of intermingled data that is all happening and really kind of living in the front end. So to me, that was something where they were building it in Livewire, they made it work in Livewire, and this may even be a really great candidate for that headless Livewire thing that Ryan was talking about, but in general, I could see why they were running into some of the edge cases of where Livewire's abilities were natively you know, optimized. So maybe it made a little bit more sense for it to be an SPA there. SP I, I basically hate SPAs, but I can look at it some, sometimes and just say, maybe this is a moment for an SPA. And that's totally fine. Not every project has to be server rendered. Also, if your company actually is better off when you have more people separated into more disparate disciplines, so for example, if you have 100 microservices and 500 developers, and it behooves you to have them have smaller subsets where they're only responsible for a tiny little bit of the work, then Livewire might not be the service for you. You might be better off with an SPA, and you actually have six different groups just within your SPA land, and that's totally fine. That, while we might look at this and laugh and think this is not the world we wanna live in, there's people where this is their reality, those people probably shouldn't choose Livewire, and that's perfectly okay. So who is Livewire actually for then? And I think a lot of people should consider Livewire, but I would say that organizations who benefit from an individual or a small team being able to ship code are people for whom Livewire is a great choice. So sure, there's a ton of companies that are using React, there's a ton of developers that have chosen React, there's lots of uh, boot camps that have chosen React, but there's a guy who unfortunately, I don't like him as a person, but he gives great advice and he says, if you wanna live like no one else later, you have to live like no one else today. And he's talking about money, but I think that applies in a lot of other spaces. So just because everybody else is using React doesn't make it actually the right fit for your business. Rather, you should say, what are my goals as a business? And if it's to ship code, LiveWire's got you covered. That's it, thank you. Nice.